Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, where we discuss DNA regulation and the insights it can tell you about your health. I'm Hannah Went, and I'm the founder of Everything Epigenetics. Today, my guest is Michael Lusgarten. This is a really great episode for anyone who's interested in biohacking their own health. Michael's goal is to live longer than everyone that has ever lived, and his brand goes by the saying, conquer aging or die trying. We talk about his history, what led him to this goal, how he defines aging, and if he considers it a disease. We also talk about how he optimizes his diet, physical activity, sleep, and body weight, and how that actually affects all of these biomarkers that he's measuring. We talk about his DNA epigenetic methylation results, which include measurements of the Horvath, Hannum, Deneen, Den Pace, and Telomere Lang test. We also chat about what he prioritizes what he's not measuring and how he uses a methodology where he only changes specific variables at a time. A little bit of background into Michael. Like I mentioned, his longstanding goal is to live longer than anyone that's ever lived on this earth. He actually plans on using the best available science to biohack his way to super longevity. And he makes videos about this and other anti-aging related topics on his YouTube and on Patreon. You'll actually get more exclusive information that he doesn't post on any other social media platforms, including daily updates for fitness metrics like RHR, HRV, sleep data, and diet, including food amounts and nutrient content. You'll also find early looks at videos in progress, including the papers that he references in different slide-to-slide setups and updates. Michael Lesgarn is a scientist on the Nutrition, Exercise, Physiology, and Sarcopenia team at the HNRCA, and his research currently focuses on the role of the gut microbiome and serum metabolome on muscle mass and function in older adults. Michael has been a guest lecturer at the Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy on topics such as the gut microbiome, serum metabolome, oxidative stress, exercise, and sarcopenia. He has contributed to over 31 publications in leading peer-reviewed journals that have been cited more than 4,000 times, including 17 manuscripts as the first or last author. Now for my guest, Michael Lesgarten. Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, Michael. I'm excited for you to be here today. Thanks for joining. Hi, Hannah. I know we were just chatting offline. I feel like you're my closer friend or colleague or whatnot. I know we've been chatting back and forth via email probably for a couple years now, which seems crazy to say, but this is the first time we're actually talking, you know, I guess face-to-face, camera-to-camera. So really excited just to learn more about you and really your biohacking over the years, how epigenetics has played a role in that. So we'll get right into it and would just love for you to introduce yourself to really me, my guest. I know you have your PhD from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. So go ahead and take it away. Yeah. So, hey, everyone. My name is Michael Lusgarden. Uh, In my day job, I'm a scientist at the Tufts Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging. And then in my uh, side job, or, uh, you know, both of these roads are a passion, obviously. But in my side job, uh, as Thomas Anderson, well, as Neo, well, I don't know, that sounds weird, but (laughs) Uh, my goal is to live longer than anyone that's ever lived. So in my side job, I've been quote unquote biohacking, trying to optimize my blood biomarkers, blood pressure, oral microbiome, you name it for probably the the last eight plus years. So um, yeah, so that's, I guess what we're going to dive, dive deep into. More people yeah. care about that than my actual day job as a scientist, which is really interesting. So, <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to pick at that a little bit. I'm curious. When did you, I guess, start getting interested in more of like the biohacking space? You said it's been around eight years, but it's really hard to juggle two separate positions. I f- I feel that way sometimes with everything epigenetics because you know I don't really work on this in my nine to five unless I'm actually physically recording and I'm doing editing and everything outside. So how did you start to balance that or realize that, hey, I'm really passionate about this. This is something I want to spend more time on. Yeah. So this has been a journey. It's been an evolution for a long time. It actually goes back way past eight years. So I started probably 2008. So 15 years where once a year I had the idea, all right, every time I go to the doctor, I'm going to record everything in a spreadsheet and I'm just going to track it over time. And I didn't understand that, you know, the uh, reference range is probably not what's optimal for health and longevity. It's just a population-based average. You're either too low or too high. I didn't get that. Like I was the 
probably like most people where it was, you know, hey, I just got my blood test back and, you know, my data is right in the middle of the range, so I'm good. So back in 2008, I had that mentality. It was only testing like once a year, but I thought it was better than nothing, right? So um, then sometimes, but then the story goes back even further than that because, um, so I have two university degrees. The first one was in English literature and okay. I wasn't, there were no scientists in my family, nobody college educated in my family. It wasn't exposed to any doctors or scientists. So I really didn't have that as a career goal as a kid. So um, after my first university degree in 94, it was, it was like, what am I going to do with my life? So I basically spent five years just roaming the United States without a clue, without a passion. And then I came across uh, Roy, Dr. Roy Walford, famous calorie restriction scientist, um, who wrote a book called Beyond the 120-Year Diet which basically detailed calorie restriction and its impact on lifespan and animal models for like 50 years. So also in that book, he had, um, he had uh, biomarker data because people who were in the biosphere experiment where they were self-enclosed and they were growing their own food, trying to replicate what it would be like to live on Mars, they were, they were studying blood biomarkers over that two year period and it improved a whole bunch of blood biomarkers. So that was in his book too. And I was like, wow, that's really fascinating blood biomarkers and aging and, you know, living past 120, I'm in. Yeah. So then I made, so my, because my first degree was in English lit, I had to go back to school uh, because I didn't have many science courses. I had astronomy one and two and physics one and two, but I didn't have biochem. So I had to go back to school for biochem, uh, you know, to, to pursue this as a career. So anyway, so I did that. And then, uh, picked an aging, you know, related lab, uh, for my graduate work. And then, yeah. So anyway, in 2008, uh, that's when, that's when the whole biohacking as a side project, uh, started with probably yeah. the goal of it, maybe being a full-time thing, seeing people like Seamland do it and, uh, yeah. Brian Johnson doing it full-time. So there is, yeah. there is a, yeah. Well, that, that's awesome. That, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about your platform, your YouTube channel and how informative your videos are, but the way you present the information, now it makes sense that you have that English background because you do such a great job at explaining what I think can be very complicated, you know, mechanism of actions and the biochemical based pathways. So I really like how you break it down. So I can see where that English degree comes from, but ah. you have to be pretty brave to go back to school for biochemistry as well. <laughs> yeah. So a couple, a couple things there. One is mm -hmm. I have very strong idiot genetics. <laughs> and what I mean, what I mean by that is, like in the class, you there you have it, when you don't know something, you have a choice. If you stay quiet, then now you're for sure on the idiot track. Whereas if you ask, now you're evolving out of that. So, yes. uh, so I know what it feels like to feel like poorly educated. So, because it's a big part of me. Like it's funny because when I was younger, I used to just goof off a lot and. Mm -hmm. People didn't really see me academically. Like my friends at the time would like just see me goofing off and they would think, wow, you're just an idiot. And I'd be like, you don't, you don't get it. There's a whole other side of me. So, so I, knowing that I, 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 ha I know what it feels like to not understand something. I try to make it as easy to understand as possible, but I still get people saying like, this is too dense for me, you yeah. know, uh, but I'm trying to make it as easily, you know, easily distilled as possible. And then it, there was something exactly. else you said that I was going to go on, but I forgot. It Going back to school, maybe? Yeah. So when I went back to school, like I, I, when I went back for biochem, I, I wasn't messing around. I didn't go out. I, I didn't do anything aside from study, exercise, and that's it. Because um, I knew that I was going to get some pushback, like, like kind of like you mentioned, like, it's a, you know, why are you going back to school? How do yeah. we know you're not going to flake out? So one of the um, faculty members who interviewed me basically brought that up and said, look, you've been out of school for five years. How do we know you're not just going to flake and just do something else? And I told him, I was like, look, you don't, I got almost straight A's in biochem. Like when people were getting 55s in organic chem and that was a C based on the curve, I was getting a, you know, 90s wow. and then saying, how come I'm not getting an A? Why are you giving me an A minus yeah. when the class <laughs> average is 55? So, so, uh, but I basically said that, look, you don't go back to school and get almost straight A's in biochem. Yeah. I, 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 at that time, I was all in. I was fully committed, you know. So I saw, I saw basically where I am now, but like twenty years earlier, and I, I kind of mapped it out, you know. How do I get to that road? So, 
we have to be proud of that. Congratulations. I mean, wow. looking back, you know, I know you're a person who, hey, I, have, I still have a ways to go or whatnot, but even just kind of laying that out and talking about those accomplishments, that's that's great. And, yeah. you know, we got kind of the story of how you went back to school and, and where your interest actually peaked in some of these, this biomarker based tracking. And you have that goal to live longer than everyone that's ever lived. And now you have this organization, Conquer Aging or Die Trying. So when did Conquer Aging or Die Trying actually become a real organization? Yeah. Uh, I don't know how real of an organization it is. It's just the <laughs> motto. It's just the motto, my motto of the channel. And I mean every every word of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, it, at some point, I, you know, I, the channel name was just my name. And then I was like, I need something catchy, you know. Yeah. So, you know, because so many people online have these just you know, so-and-so health maximalist or, mm -hmm. you know, so-and-so wants you to live and that's their handle. So I was like, all right, let's put it down. Conquer aging or die trying, you know? Yeah. So. Well, it's super catchy. I really like that as well. And of course, you know, with our rejuvenation Olympics, I think it's like, it's the same exact saying, but saying it different ways, the race you never want to win or whatnot. Right. But I think yours is a little bit um, easier understood and, and upfront. Yeah. So I really like that. But it could, it could turn some people off because, you know, <laughs> it's uh, hearing the or die trying, I think can trigger some people where they're just like, oh, I don't want to, it's just too crazy for me, but it is what it is, you know? So yeah, you have to be all in. Right. And I know your central premise as well is that, Hey, if we have these well-established biomarkers, not only have them, but if we're actually using them and we're able to track them of different organ systems, systemic health, other, again, mechanism of, of actions going back into those biochemical pathways and using probably what you learned when you went back to school, you know, can aging and disease risk be slowed? So that's kind of the question that you're answering. And just to ponder on that, you know, what do you, how, how would you define aging yourself and maybe talk about if you would consider as a disease as well? Yeah, so uh, it, it it's just a, just the simple definition. It's the progressive deterioration with organ and systemic function over time, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and then in terms of of it being a disease or not, so I actually wrote a paper a few years ago. Uh, you know, so somebody published the paper uh, trying to classify aging as a disease, and then at that time, my academic work was leading me towards the gut microbiome and a potential influence on muscle, like gut muscle axis. So I started doing a deep dive into the impact of just all of the microbiome, mouth, skin, you know, gut everywhere, um, and published the paper, you know, saying, hey, if aging is classified as a disease, don't forget about the microbes. And that was before that, uh, you know, the microbiome was even considered as one of the hallmarks of aging, which in the latest update it is. So um, is it a disease? Um, I don't know. This gets into semantics. And like when people debate that, <laughs> debate that stuff online, I, I kind of run away from it because, yeah. you know, they're, they're the types who want to just debate semantics all day. And then there are the types like me who are just mm -hmm. like, I want to get in and actually try to do something about it. So I think it is a disease, you know, yeah. we didn't evolve, you know, humans haven't, haven't lived long enough to evolve the genetics to basically of more immortality, I guess that's the easiest way to put it. And but fortunately, we've got the, you know, the, the brain capacity to develop tools to, uh, to overcome that, right? But it's just mm -hmm. a question of can you, can you overcome the genetics of not having immortality coded in your genome? You know, can you use, the, the, you know, the human brain capacity to get around that within a 70-year time span to push human longevity forward, whereas the genetics won't do it for who knows how long, right? So yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree with you for, for what it's worth. Yes. Not going to get caught up on the semantics and what it means if aging is defined as a disease for society or grants or, or whatnot. But I, I really do. I think everything else, these diseases we see, type 2 diabetes, me metabolic uh, disease, even things like kidney, liver, or different organ system diseases, and even cancer. You know, if we attack aging head on first, it actually mitigates those diseases too. So, hey, let's take a step back figure out step one, which is aging, and then slow those progression of those diseases as well. So um, even, even if yeah. you've got the healthiest lifestyle, just like you said, aging is underlying all, all of these diseases. So maybe I'll delay it for 50 years, right? I won't get it. I won't get type two diabetes at some age. It'll just be some later age. Like I'm sure, you know, centenarians have delayed onset of diseases by like 20 or 30 years, right? So yeah. um, 
So it's coming for everyone, no, no matter what, right? So for sure, it, the, the, you know, the foundation, foundation roots of aging to actually study and optimize. Yeah, for sure. But there is another central premise of my channel besides track and optimize. And it's basically self-empowerment. Like we don't have to wait for RCTs and other people. We don't have to wait for animal studies that may or may not translate into human longevity. We can test ourselves and often, you know, um, I think most take, most people take that for granted. Like so many people are taking supplements and they never actually see like, is this a net benefit, neutral or detrimental to my actual health? So that that's probably, you know, the third rung of the uh, premise, essential premise, like track, test and track, you know, yeah. don't take something based on hope. What is the data? What is your own data say? So. Exactly. And, and I, I talk about that day in and day out. I feel like now there was a key word there that I really liked. You said, which was, you kind of corrected yourself. You said, track your data, track your own data. Right. Yeah. And I think that's really important. And we'll get into exactly what you've been doing, which is, is great and a amazing proof of concept. But even with the epigenetic DNA methylation testing, a lot of people see, oh, well, there's this clinical trial and there's still very few clinical trials as we know, right? It's, it's very new technology. And they'll go to something based on that clinical trial. And I'll say, well, wait a second. Sure, you can use that as a guide, but we still don't even know if that works for you. So every single clinical trial is still going to be biased in the sense that they're testing a very specific population and you have your own biological makeup. Yep. So I really do encourage people to track all sorts of biomarkers, epigenetics not being the only part of the picture. Just gave that example because, of course, my platform and what we're talking about today. So you know, um, what I want to know now, Michael, is what are you doing? Tell me, tell me what you're tracking. You, you know, I yeah. see age biomarkers. I see um, all sorts of other biomarker testing. But tell me a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah. So I started with the standard chem panel, um, the CBC. And uh, so I started with that, which is a $35 test. And most people, it's probably the most underrated thing that can be done to quote unquote optimize health because it includes not just glucose and lipids, you know, metabolic health. It's got markers of kidney and liver function, immune cells, red blood cells. I mean, all things that change during aging. So um, I started with that. So I've got basically a quote unquote big picture panel of about 20 to 25 biomarkers that cover all of those organ systems. Uh, and then I added once Morgan Levine published her or Dr. Morgan Levine published her, you know, I get so casual. Everybody to me is just, the, you know, the name without the, the you know, anyway. So without the authority part. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so then when she published her phenowage, I added in high sensitivity C-reactive protein. But even that, I mean, they're like, I'm sure, you know, there, you know, there's like uh, immune age and it's like a whole panel of immune biomarkers, but uh, biomarkers that aren't commercially available though. I mean, I'd, I'd happily measure all that too. But I, so HSCRP, and then, you know, it's funny because like epigenetics is not my background. It's not my forte. Like my forte was on the, you know, all, all the basics, the standard chem panel CBC. And then uh, Ryan was gracious enough to, uh, Ryan Smith, for those who don't know, was gracious enough to say, uh, hey, if you want some epigenetic kits, you know, I'll send them to you. No problem. And I, I, I was like, okay. But I didn't, yeah. even, didn't think anything of it. And then they just sat in my, you know, my apartment for a couple months. And I was trying to, because you've got to know what you want to measure. You've got to understand. And epigenetics was so new that I really did. And then as I started doing deep dives, I was like, oh, I see. I get it. I get it now. Right. So, yeah. So then I add, added that in and you guys do telomere testing too. So that's a part of the approach. Um, so, but then I've expanded it even further to oral microbiome. Cause I've had issues with oral health my whole life, probably most of it's self-imposed because my, you know, I wasn't, uh, I grew up on a junk food diet. I didn't floss. Um, so I've, I've optimized that as much as I can now, but it, it's, it's a similar approach to what you see Brian doing, uh, Brian Johnson, who's popularized it, you know, um, which is basically trying to optimize every organ system that exists. And, um, you know, it, it, and, you know, just going back to, back to that central premise, if you, if you know what it looks like in a youthful state, at least in terms of biomarkers, you could potentially slow it, delaying disease, maximizing longevity, and then hopefully living long enough to live forever if that's within the next 70 years or so. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, I don't know if I would, would consider myself a quote unquote biohacker, whatever you'd like to call it. There's a lot of different terms out there. And I know some people don't like the word biohacker, um, but obviously I care very much about my health. I'm, I'm tracking it. I'm using some of those actual biomarkers to get a baseline. 
do certain end of one experimentation and then track afterwards as well to see if it's hopefully a positive change, maybe a negative change. Um, in terms of what I do, I don't think I've ever talked about this before, but I have a longevity healthcare provider. I get my labs done, all my hormones, everything done, probably includes that CBC panel that you mentioned. Um, about every six months, I've been a little bit bad and I've waited too long this time, but I'm going in the next two weeks over to Quest, you know, fasted in the morning, get it over with. Um, so I'm happy to, to track those even um, and get kind of my values and see, oh, am I deficient in magnesium? Do I need to take more vitamin D or, or maybe certain hormones as well? So I think people don't realize how simple it can be too. Like you mentioned, the $35, $50 range somewhere in there. For the, for the basics, yeah. So mm -hmm. I wish I had been as rigorous earlier. Like if I could go back and so instead of, you know, kind of blazing the trail and not knowing what I'm doing and only tracking once a year, I wish I was doing it, you know, seven times a year now, but in my 20s. And the reason I say that is like, I, when I see, like, it's funny, because sometimes I'll see someone in their 80s, and I'll be like, what did they look like when they were young? And, you know, even, even like, for someone who looks relatively young in their 50s, you can still see that there's some, and even relatively fit people, you can, whether it's face structure, or maybe it's hormones. So and even for myself, I mean, hair, not, you know, withstanding, you know, granted, shaved, not, not alopecia, but um Anyway, so what I'm trying to get at, I think hormones may be the, you know, um, androgens and estrogens, respectively, for men and women. I, I didn't track that at all for a very, very long time. But I wonder if keeping them at optimal levels from youth to 50s and beyond, like, would retain some of that youthful look at advanced age. Um, because you could have, it's, yeah. I think it's relatively easy to have optimal markers of kidney and liver and immune cells. I think that's relatively easy. But I don't know that that drives the, youth, the quote unquote youthful look as much. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting take. And it'd be great to have that data. Of course, at True Diagnostic, we usually test people between their 40s and 60s, just because that's who our healthcare providers are seeing, right? And we always encourage people to do this testing in your 20s or 30s, just to again, get that data profile, that um, information about oneself set up. Now, I will say the one recommendation we make to those healthcare providers, and the one thing that's been proven uh, in an interventional trial is just hormone replacement therapy in um, yeah. women uh, who have gone through menopause. But again, delaying the onset of menopause can have some really great aging effects as well. I will say that most of the patients that we treat are probably on some type of hormone replacement therapy and we have a very very healthy population so i do think there's probably some correlation there i don't want to say definitively because it's very very subjective is what i'm saying but we can run a massive analysis and again see which uh products are better correlated with of course better aging or even like age at onset of menopause like I'm, I'm i'm betting that the women who had the, the you know most delayed onset of menopause probably have like the youngest either horvath mm -hmm. or dunedin pace you know and then i wonder how that translates if they're able to keep it up you know for longevity right so yeah yeah, yeah. definitively and and we'll, i think we'll learn more about that as as time goes on as well um it's it's weird to me i i um have had someone ask me this question. I'm curious to see what you think. So of course we know men age quicker than women, right? And they die younger compared to women because of that sex paradox. Um, so this is kind of the, the topic we were talking about. Yet we know pregnancy really, really advances uh, women's age and we go through menopause, right? So why do you think that men still age quicker and die younger when women are going through these really drastic hormonal based changes? And still live longer. And yeah. still live longer. Purely speculation yeah. that obviously, you know, wasn't on our little agenda or talking yeah. points here, just kind of going with this conversation. Do you have any thoughts about that? I don't. So I'm, what do you got? N not much. <laughs> just that, um, you know, there have been a couple papers by Jesse Poganik out of um, uh, Harvard uh, under Vadim Gladyshev's lab who did look at different stressors and how biological age is affected. And pregnancy is one of those stressors, but it can be corrected once the stressor is gone it can be restored essentially the biological age um past even baseline if they're doing things that can better their health health um but yeah i i still don't know i i think that still doesn't account for like the physiological i guess part of pregnancy that we go through right in the healing of the body so i don't know just wondered if you had any other snippets <laughs> so now that i'm thinking about it some more just to play devil's advocate maybe yeah. maybe uh men are more likely to have a poor diet and smoke i, I don't know that this is the case but yeah. uh 
you know, but then I'm thinking animal studies, you know, even then do female mice live longer than male mice on a calorie restricted diet or any intervention? I, sometimes some interventions are sex specific, but I don't know that like female animal models would necessarily live longer. I guess it depends on the intervention, but it's a tough yeah. human study to do. My first thought yeah. is just women are, women have evolved for longevity and the, you know, the men are more disposable, I guess. Right. So, yeah, no, I, I forgot. It, it was like a curveball, and, um, yeah, I, we really didn't ask some colleagues and didn't really get anywhere. Um, had a couple of thoughts like, like you and I are having right now, but if anyone listening wants to, you know, drop a comment or, or talk about this and maybe give us some reasons, that'd be great. Um, so to follow up. So yeah. I, I only mentioned the, the, blood testing side of it, right? So the other side of that is I'm not just testing se up to seven times a year. It's uh, I'm tracking, you know, diet, fitness metrics, sleep. And then I've looked, I, so I basically uh, have tracked. So that hardcore approach of tracking almost literally, literally everything, the food goes back to 2015. So that's eight years. The fitness metrics is about five years. And uh, so for, for every blood test, I have an average dietary intake that corresponds to that blood test. So if you test on day one and you test on day 60 for the 59 day period in between, you have an average dietary intake and you can line that up with every, with every blood test. So I've been doing that since 2015 and, and based on how, so after every test, I've been calculating correlations and then, you know, so most people have the idea, like just in standard academic studies, you have two groups and you give one group an intervention and the goal is to only change literally one thing or in an animal model, right? But that's almost completely impossible in human studies. So, and even for someone like me, who's highly motivated, who tracks their diet, who weighs all my food, um, you know, th there'll still be little things that'll be off, whether it's a vitamin or mineral, whatever it may be. But so what I'm trying to say is after each test, I cal recalculate the correlations and then I modify my diet to try to push the net effect of biomarkers in, in a given direction. So, yeah. you know, it's easy to say, all right, I want to optimize glucose and lipids and forget about completely everything else. For me, it's when I'm optimizing uh, glucose or lipids, it's how does that look like? How does that intervention look like in the, in the net effect of all of the other biomarkers? So if it makes glucose lower, but makes seven other biomarkers worse, that's not gonna, that's not, and that for just as an example, like total fat, you know, um, for me, for whatever reason, a very high fat diet, which is when I go above about 40%, more blood biomarkers start going in the wrong direction than right. So using that approach, I've been able to find the fat amount, find the protein amount, find the vitamin and mineral amounts that are, you know, associated with, uh, the most, most youthful biomarker profile. <laughs> and I hate to say yeah. it, but that's kind of the reason why it's only a matter of time before I'm at the top of that rejuvenation leaderboard <laughs> and everybody's looking at me trying to, because it, yeah. it's completely objective. It's not like I take a hundred, so I don't take a hundred supplements, nowhere close, not to put anybody on blast, we know what we're talking about, but I'm a big fan of him. I'm not trying to put, yeah. him, put him on blast, but um, eventually everyone's got to come around to this approach and track literally everything and then look at, you know, how does this impact that within the full context? So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's phenomenal. I mean, we need a calculator from you, right? Yeah. <laughs> we need your kind of uh, the, so the your type of approach there. Mm -hmm. The weakness, though, is just going back to that, um, you know, one change at a time, one intervention at a time. So, you know, for a given panel of biomarkers, I may have, you know, 20 things in my diet that send the net effect positive and 20 things that send the net effect negative, mm -hmm. right? So, I'm not following one thing. I'm not following the top thing or the bottom thing. You know, I'm trying to literally follow them all. So in other words, mm -hmm. if my, if my correlative score for protein is negative five, I eat below my average intake and that would be expected to have a better effect on biomarkers than if I went higher for protein. So, okay. my, so the, I have scores for every macro and micronutrient and even for individual foods, correlative mm -hmm. scores with the blood biomarkers. So I try to follow literally them all. So it's for me and in, in working with clients, I see that as the best approach because, you know, uh, it, it isn't one thing, you know, it's just like genetics where it's to say that one gene, even though sometimes one gene can affect, you know, a whole organism, but, you know, when it comes to longevity, it's probably going to be thousands of genes working together, if not more. So I kind of try to have the same approach. All right, I'm going to follow all of the positive correlations and follow all, you know, minimize the foods that are all of the negatives. 
without knowing which one or which group is actually doing it. And I'm probably losing some information using that approach. But if I was going to take the truly academic approach of this one at a time thing, it would take me years just to figure out and yeah. who has that time, right? So, I mean, literally, who has that time? Yeah. Dead, <laughs> right? Yeah, you're going to be dead. Die trying, right? Yeah. So, um, no, I, I still think that's a wonderful pro approach. And again, there's going to be some pros and cons with each approach. That one's going to take a, a long time. I, again, we don't have the time we have to do what we can with what we have right now. So that's, that's just amazing. I mean, it's so hard just to change one thing before and after, but I encourage people. I mean, I spend most of my time every single day, Monday through Friday, even on the weekend, speaking with healthcare providers and saying, Hey, I know you have your EMR or your certain tracking system, but really track everything. And it's just so hard. I mean, they're, you know, prescribing all sorts of different things at the same time. And I'm saying, wait a second, maybe you're taking way too much. Maybe you're not at some metabolic homeostatic level and you know we're not able to actually know what's being affected so slow down maybe take some things away i do have an app uh just called way of life where i'm tracking like three little daily habits and i think i meditate you know every day before i go to bed i think i do these things and then i actually track it and i'm like oh crap oh my gosh i haven't meditated in three weeks right or whatnot so when you actually see it too that's at least helped me and, and it's more about that that habit building and that repeatability yeah, definitely. Just along the lines of, uh, you know, trying to get uh, doctors uh, to track like or the medicines for their patients or whatever it may be in the context of a patient's health record. So, you know, uh, statins, as you know, for lowering uh, total cholesterol. Right. So I've worked with people who their cholesterol levels on statins will be very low, what you would expect. But then other things in the, you know, like whether it's kidney function markers or liver uh, markers, will be elevated. And so I've gone into the published literature to see, all right, can, you know, can statins impact these things? And sure enough, there is evidence that statins can negatively affect the liver and negative, negatively affect the kidney, even muscle to release creatinine into the blood to make it look like a kidney function problem when it could be muscle damage. So I yeah. wonder how much medicine is actually considering the full context rather than, all right, you've got high cholesterol. We're going we're gonna to give you a statin but we're not going to even measure or look at the other stuff. And if the other stuff is, is even in the high end of the range, we don't care because we want to bring your cholesterol down, which is, I mean, it's a yeah. terrible approach, right? So it, it, yeah, it, it's pretty insane. Just a side note on that real quick. I'm going to give a shout out to my grandfather, actually. <laughs> um, he was on a, uh, a statin and then started to get, yeah, some, you know, muscle atrophy and, and some issues and, and whatnot. So it was so funny to watch him because he does, does not have a science background, but to go down this path and he started Googling and he started saying, why is this happening to me? And, you know, was asking me all of these questions about his health. So I just thought that was super interesting. And um, funny that you bring that up anyways, there's actually one epigenetic methylation marker where if you take a statin, it's the ABCG1 gene, that gene is actually shut off mm -hmm. and your type two um, diabetes risk skyrockets. So if that gene is shut off, you're affecting your insulin sensitivity. And we see people who take statins have that increase in type two diabetes because that gene is shut off. So that's where you get more into the crazy pharmaco epigenetic world in space. That'll be its own field in probably the next decade or so. But we're starting to find more and more of those correlations and connections as we do deeper lit literature dry, uh, dives, just like you mentioned. Then it becomes like a, a modulation of risk kind of thing, right? Because if you mm -hmm. actually have you know, cardiovascular disease and atheros atherosclerotic plaque, then it's obviously the most imperative to reduce your lipid levels because that that's like gold standard. I mean, you know, yeah. CBD, right? But then, you know, it's if you don't die from heart disease, but now you're increasing, like you said, type two diabetes risk and and whatever else may come with that. You know, how does that? What's that trade off, right? You don't die from CBD, but now you end up with liver liver cancer. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Michael, going back to what you're doing a little bit, you know, I I heard you say. Uh, that you're like measuring your food and you're doing all of these things. So with, I think too, we don't have to get into the specifics of your biomarkers. If anyone wants to look into that, please, please, please watch his videos. They're absolutely great. But um, give me your secret sauce. Tell me what you're doing from, you know, let's get into diet, physical activity, sleep, body weight. And then I would like to talk about those epigenetic methylation markers and just where you see your aging going and what actually triggers those too. Yeah. So in terms of diet, just to keep it, uh, uh, easy breezy it the profile that makes my quote unquote biomarkers look the best for now or that's associated with the best profile is about and this includes uh, um, so fiber is converted to short chain fatty acids so fiber can be 
considered uh, fat. You can add that to the fat category. So total fats about 40%, total carbs or net carbs about 40%, and then uh, proteins uh, about 18%. Uh, so, and again, I didn't start, I didn't, haven't settled on that just based on the epidemiological studies that's following the, you know, uh, correlations of biomarkers. So body weight, I've been trying to get as lean as possible for a very long time. I grew up, at, you know, looking at bodybuilding magazines and always trying to be lean and ripped. Um, thinking, how could you ever die? You know, if you're if you're high, highly lean and highly functional. So um, I'm slowly trying to get towards six percent. I'm probably at about eight or nine percent now, um, which was higher in the past. So about twelve percent, and that may actually be what's driving my Dunedin pace, because as you know, uh, it's the only epigenetic clock in that head-to-head -head matchup of uh, five other epigenetic clocks that showed a epigenetic age reduction, right, for people on CR for two years. So my Dunedin pace has actually been coming down since I started um, sequentially almost every test. And the only thing that's, I haven't made major changes to my diet, but I've been purposely reducing my body weight and my body fat percentage over that time. So that may be the, the, the factor that's driving it the most. And in support of that, you know, uh, people like Seamland and Brian Johnson who have relatively low scores, they're also very lean compared to the average population. So I don't know, that would be my hypothesis for that. I track yeah. fitness metrics, which help me um, titrate how much exercise, how often, um, even which days I should be training versus not. Um, well, I see the treadmill in the background too, so you have yeah. to be doing some some cardio there. Well, for for cardio, it, it's I haven't done the treadmill so much these days. I do mostly okay. low intensity cardio, but the the core of my workouts is an eighty minute workout with uh, compound movements. You know overhead press, pull-ups, some deadlifts. If, I, if my, I have a herniated disc in my lower back from ego lifting as a kid, which, you know, so I have to be very careful there, but yeah. um, it, compound movements, calisthenics, some Taekwondo related stuff, uh, some mobility balance and flexibility, all, you know, so the goal is to be, you know, so there's also a gait that's associated with uh, age, right? If you look at someone's gait and how they move and even how they're able to move, you can see that someone looks old just based on their movement patterns. So yeah, my workouts are uh, tailored so that I don't, or I minimize that as much as possible. I don't want to ever look at me and someone's like, why wow, you move like an old person, right? So, um, so yeah, it's like an 80 minute workout. But yeah. the fit, when I started tracking the fitness uh, stuff, heart rate, variability, resting heart rate, uh, I was chronically overtrained. I mean, I was doing workouts that were way too long. These cardiovascular fitness metrics look like someone who was uh, sedentary, which was ridiculous. I was walking 15 to 20 miles a week, doing three hour weightlifting workouts once or twice a week. I mean, I was highly trained. So uh, you, the fitness metrics to me are essential for uh, knowing when to train, how much to train, how often. Uh, but it, that, even that too was a big, a bit of an ego hit because uh, yeah. I mean, I've said it before, I like throwing heavyweights around like a gorilla for three hours. <laughs> you know, it's what it's, I love the challenge, but it, it's just murder for me in terms of, uh, my recovery is too slow. I feel terrible for a week. Uh, so yeah. Are you tracking that with whoop or a wearable or something yeah, like that? Whoop, okay. I'm okay. Using whoop. Gotcha. Uh, but, but any fit, any, any wearable, I think, I think most of them, most of them are pretty good where they, they give that basic information, heart rate, variability, resting heart rate, mm -hmm. the average daily heart rate, which even knowing it took me a while to figure that out too. So, um, if, if it's a workout day, my, my heart rate for that day would be relatively high. And it took, took me a while to figure out that I do best in terms of quote unquote recovery for the next workout, uh, in terms of performance in, during that workout, if my heart rate the next couple of days is purposefully lower. Now, if I wasn't tracking that, it's very easy for me, or, you know, I don't know if other people, but it's very easy for me if my heart rate on that day is 58 beats per minute on a workout, it may be 60, 62. And then now I'm not recovering as fast because I'm still chronically stressing myself. So seeing the data has really helped me hone it in such that this morning's data, it was uh 81 41 for heart rate variability, resting heart rate. I mean, that's like almost endurance athletes that are, you know, elite cyclists. It's like 140 and I'm not nowhere yeah. near that, you know, so that I can kind of quote unquote biohack my way towards that direction. I don't know for me, impressive. Yeah. But, and yeah, then... no, that's that's great to hear. And and again, people are just like, what do I do? What do I do? Someone show me the data. And first and foremost, you need to start tracking these things yourself. But um, I think we actually see that a lot in more of those Horvath related epigenetic age clocks, those first generation kind of chronological age ones. Um, again, getting closer to chronological age, but 
still trying to measure an epigenetic methylation process. And we see in people who are more of the elite athletes or, you know, Olympians that they actually have those faster, more intrinsic or Horvath related epigenetic ages. So Mm. I think that's really interesting. I think, you know, Kristen McGreevy has a has an interesting algorithm called DNA methylation fit age. Um, True Diagnostic is getting ready to release a version of that soon based on our omic age data set that we've done. And that's going to give you your fitness, your your biological age based on your fitness levels too. So I'd be curious to see how that tracks because we're going to do VO2 max, FEV1, grip strength, and gait speed as well. Wait, wait. So you were saying that people who are more active would have older Horvath ages or I interpreted that wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Usually we wow. see that trend. Huh. Yeah. So people come back and, uh, it's funny to speak with like their, these healthcare providers who, Oh, Hey, this person was, you know, an elite cyclist or just, uh, just ran, just performed in a triathlon or, or whatnot and trained this much. And I, and why do they have these really bad intrinsic epigenetic ages? And well, we believe it's due to some, or some obvious compounded oxidative stress that may lead to inflammation that may lead to a cascade Cascading negative fall of events and, and affect those epigenetic methylation patterns. So it's just ever so slightly. We want to see more of a variety of movements. I like to call it rather than you know working exercise. Uh, so so walk, lift weights. You know, good rule of thumb: lift weights at least a couple times a week. Right as we age, we lose that muscle mass. Um, do the yoga, do the taekwondo, different things like you were saying as well. Because again, your body's not getting used to this one movement. You're not putting as much stress on it. So what you're saying, this is why I like speaking with you, what you're saying from the biomarker perspective and all of these wearables is literally matching the data that I know from an epigenetic space. Nice. So <laughs> the, that elite athletes or the athletes would have older Horvath ages. I mean, it, it could be just overtraining. I mean, it's maybe it's not the... Oh, yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's just funny that, you know... It, all of my other, so my Horvath age right now is right at my chronological age. But if I wanted to spin that a different way, it's been as high as like 56. So it's like, technically I could say over the last three or four tests, I've reduced it from 56 to 50, but I don't know that I would yeah. make that, you know, exaggerate a claim, but um, yeah. I, it, yeah. Anyway. No, I, absolutely. That's, that's great. So um, no, you went over diet, the physical activity. Um, what about your sleep? Are you, yeah. you're tracking that with whoop as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sleep sleep is probably the hardest one to track or not track, mm-hmm. but to optimize. And okay. you know, so there there are some base so I should preface by saying my sleep has always been bad going back to maybe teenage years um or sleep quality and duration not been great. Now, mm-hmm. sleep hygiene is a real thing. Maybe I didn't believe it at some point in the past, but I believe it now and I've been in that boat of go to sleep at the same time. I bought some stuff to black out most of my uh, windows so that I don't get residual light coming in because I'm right on the street in Boston. So like, even though my shade is pulled closed, if the, if the wind blows the shade a little bit, I can get a ray of light. And I've been awakened by a ray of light hitting my eyes while I'm asleep, which is crazy. So, yeah. uh, so going, I, I literally go to sleep at the same time every night. I black out the room as much as possible. I sleep with earplugs to because it's busy, you know, and I, it wakes me up in the middle of the night if I don't. But, and then uh, I also, uh, I, my, my eating window is relatively short and it doesn't necessarily impact my blood biomarkers, but stopping the eating window as early as possible for me on a uh, at home work day, it's around uh, one o'clock, almost all of my calories on a uh, in-person work day. It's a little bit later, maybe three o'clock. So my bedtime's around nine. So I've got about a six hour window at least where there's no food, very little water. Um, so the majority of it is earlier in the day. And that uh, helps because then I'm not waking up two, three, four times during the night, which I, that was in the past, you know, that's how uh, it was. There were even times yeah. where I'd eat one meal a day and fast all day, eat from six to nine. And I mean, I was every, every hour I'd wake up and then the next morning I feel awful because you know waking up every, mm-hmm. you know, so often. But like yeah. I said, sleep for me is the hardest thing to optimize because even with all of those little tricks of the trade that have helped my sleep in, in, immeasurably, uh, well, I shouldn't say immeasurably, but Interesting. Uh, um, so I had a sleep study done uh, 10-ish, 12 something years ago, where I went for the gold standard uh, polysomnography, where you actually mm-hmm. sleep in a you know, climate controlled room and they gear you up with electrodes. At that time, only 5% of my total sleep time was in deep sleep. Deep sleep declines during aging. 
So 5% is something you'd expect to see in like an 80 year old. So, and that was oh, wow. when I was in my early thirties. So now whoop has been compared against uh, PSG and uh, you know, for deep sleep, it's been found to be comparable. So I'm actually getting a lot more than 5%. I'm actually up to 20 to 25%. Deep oh, sleep. Good. So yeah, so it can be improved. Um, now with that said, and I mentioned, you know, it's probably the hardest thing to optimize because how can you stay asleep when you're asleep? You know, falling asleep, I mean, it's, you know, you just got to get into a little meditative zone for me. So, but like, like clockwork, I'm up three to five hours after I uh, go to sleep. And then yeah, within the last two or three hours before uh, waking up, it's sometimes every hour last night. Um, maybe it was because I was like, all right, I got to get to work, into work at a certain time. So I got to leave at a certain time to be back here. But yeah. I was up, it was like every 20 minutes from three to five, which Oh, wow. You're excited for this podcast. <laughs> for sure. For sure. But there you go. <laughs> it's just, uh, but other nights it's like that too, where it's, uh, you know, yeah. I'm up three or four times, right? I mean, I'm up and conscious and I actually have yeah. to like, tell myself, I have to calm myself down and like literally have to meditate myself to sleep. Most nights I can do that, but every so often it doesn't work. So, you know, then that gets into, uh, you know, is it a melatonin issue? Is it so optimizing that I'm still, I'm cooking up some biochemical pathways and, uh, you know, see what I can do. Um, nice. We'll, well, I'm excited to see what comes. I'm going to send you someone I like for sleep too. I'll give a, a shout out. Her name is Molly McLaughlin. I think it, she just got married. It's Molly Eastman. Now, if you follow her and, and whatnot, her content is really, really good on Instagram and stuff too. I think I've checked her out. I don't know. I think I, yeah. that name sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards, but that's interesting. I'm funny enough. Sleep is actually the easiest thing for me. Probably <laughs> when I wear my whoop down, it's like hundred, hundred, hundred. And then I, I'll look at the metrics too, to make sure I'm getting enough and REM deep sleep, et cetera. Um, I probably fall asleep too fast. Like I can fall asleep in the movie theaters type of thing if I'm tired enough. Um, so that's something, you know, I probably need to work on, but if I could go to bed at, you know, 6 PM, I'd be in bed. So I, I usually Try eight thirty nine, wind down, put the phone away, no screens, you know, stop eating hours ahead of time, um, all of that good stuff. So no, I'm really excited to, yeah, to have heard about what you're doing. Now, um, do you prioritize any one of those or any biomarker or would you just say sleep because that's the hardest for you right now? So uh they're all important. You know, I don't want to put one okay. above the other, but I, sleep is probably the most important of, of them all because if my sleep quality is bad and I'm up a few times. Not only can that, so there are times when I'm so wide awake at two in the morning and I try to minimize these occurrences as much as possible, but I'm so wide awake and then I'm just laying there in bed for like an hour that I'll eat my breakfast at 1 a.m. And then mm -hmm. within like an hour, or half an hour, boom, I'm asleep. So it could be some aspect of CR that's impairing my sleep quality at that point, but interesting. But that kills my, my data, my heart rate variability, resting heart rate. And then knowing that I'm ready I'll, I'll have overtrained data because I ate so late or so early. I'm not training on that day. So if that was a scheduled workout day and I ruined it by my poor sleep quality, now I got to push that another day. So uh, sleep is essential. You know, even for me, like even like a 30 to 60 minute sleep debt over a couple of days, it can start to affect my mental and, and you know, physical performance. Oh, so um, absolutely. Yeah. I, I know when I wake up in the middle of the night or this, this has happened more recently when I'm like traveling because I'm not an anxious flyer. I'm, I'm fine when I'm in planes or cars or traveling, but just the fact that I'm like, oh, I set my alarm for, you know, 4am to head to the airport. I'm like, you know, up and I think anxious and just a little stressed out and I'll wake up and check, you know, the clock and go back to bed. So it's like, you kind of just start getting a little bit of a, that acute stress where the wheels start turning and then you're up and, you know, you're thinking about all sorts of things. So I, I can, I can definitely work on that. So, um, Michael, what aren't you tracking? Is there anything you're, you're like, I just, I, why didn't I start tracking that earlier? Or are you not tracking one thing? Um, that you can think of. Yeah. So I, it was hormones. I wish I, I went back and tracked hormones. hormone levels mm -hmm. earlier, especially like DHEA sulfate, which declines during aging. And I have this in a video where my levels were youthful 15 years ago and I didn't track it at all. I just forgot about it. Mm -hmm. It's not under standard chem panel. And then once I started tracking it last summer, now I have 20 plus tests now and all of them are pretty low. And granted, it's not reference range low, but it's just low relative to my own and then relative to, you know, what youthful levels look like. So mm -hmm. how do you, you know, it's almost like if your, if your organ function, you know, it's like, it's if you're bleeding to death and you give someone, an, you know, uh, uh, tr a transfusion, a blood transfusion, 
it's hemorrhagic shock. They can, they can die anyway. You know, it's just, you hit this point of no return that you can't, you can give someone that's hemorrhaging blood and they're going to bleed to death anyway, because they've just lost, they've lost so much blood. So I hope that that's not the case for my adrenal glands where, you know, it's, it's, they've aged or whatever it is. And it's almost like, no matter what I do, I can't rejuvenate them back using, you know, uh, my standard diet and exercise or whatever else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so in terms of what am I not doing? I mean, I, I can see a road for the gut microbiome. I've done it a few times. It's hard. Not that it's hard. I wouldn't say that, but, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, you just, you need, it's more than just who's there. And then it's more than just, you know, in terms of, so 16S is what, uh, you, Mm -hmm. you would get the species that are there. If you're using or whole genome sequencing, you would get the species. If you use something like Viome, you're going to get what's the active gene expression. So I would kind of need both who's there and what's the active gene expression. Mm-hmm. So now I'm getting too much into the weeds, you know, almost. Because <laughs> yeah. The reason I say that is, you know, you could have changes in the gut microbiome, but you'd expect to see something reflected physiologically, at least in the blood, right? So, mm. so if I mm-hmm. tweak various levels of, of certain species in the gut and don't see any changes on, you know, in my uh, circulating biomarkers, whether it's metabolome or or uh, proteins or cells. And sure. We, so, so I, I don't want to get too lost in the details of the microbiome there, but that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, M- yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. Whole whole body MRI. I mean, that that's something that uh, you know. Yeah. I'm hearing more and more about that as well, and some some like uh, health optimization based groups I'm in, and that the wait list is like months even. Mm. Um, if it's I forget what the company is is called who does it. If it's not just like at a healthcare provider or longevity, I can dig it up and, and send it to you later. But yeah, you know, I think Michael, what at least to me, I think everything you're doing is purely evidence based, right? Like you said, you're looking at these biomarkers, and I think that's the the take home here is, hey, even if we're looking at your biomarkers, it could mean dif- something different to someone else. So I encourage everyone to to follow along and and really look at um, Michael's Michael's videos and, and check out his kind of profile and, and what he stands for. So um, getting more toward the end here, but uh, also want to know what your most surprising find was when tracking biomarkers. Does anything stick out? So there's an idea that some biomarkers are, uh, they aren't malleable. For example, lipoprotein A, which is thought mm-hmm. to be, you know, you only have to test it once. That's not my words. That's that, like, you know, health professionals just measure it once or once a year or whatever it is because your levels are genetically determined and they won't change. So I thought that for a long time. And, you know, back in the 2008 days when I was testing once a year, I thought, oh, I'll never reduce this, right? And then I started to look at studies and try various interventions. And sure enough, it was pretty resistant to, to, to change. I couldn't change it. But then once I started calculating those correlations with my diet, I figured out, all right, this dietary composition cuts it in half. You know, I could probably get it even lower, but it goes back to that, you know, the bottom of the U shape, where if I, if I, if I do the things that bring it down to, you know, 75% reduction, other stuff, other stuff goes in the wrong direction. So I have to be, you know, comfortable with that 50% reduction from the peak while not messing up a whole bunch of other biomarkers. So um, I think all of the biomarkers are malleable and uh, it's just a matter of figuring out your own recipe to, to, uh, to affect them. But that said, yeah. you know, once, once I get the Horvath uh, data, into the forties, people are going to be like, wow, you reduced it so much. It's only a matter of time, but I'm hot on the trail of the, like I said, the DHEA story, because even though it's been 20 plus tests, if, or once I'm able to reverse that trend and get it going in the right direction, there's, there are no RCTs on, uh, you know, usually if someone's got low DHEA sulfate, you're just given DHEA, you just take it as a supplement. That's like the Mm -hmm. standard of care. But, you know, I, I, part of me is arrogant as, as arrogant AF. And I'm like, look, I'm going to, I'm going to show you, right. That whether or not I can do it, whether or not I can do it, maybe to be 50 tests, I don't know, but with enough data, I think I'm going to discover my own recipe without messing up anything else to figure out how to start pushing that back towards the right direction. I actually have another video coming pretty soon on uh, potentially impacting DHEA sulfate. So yeah. yeah. Well, no, I'm excited. I'm, I'm very, very excited. So um, I, I just, the the list of questions I want to ask keeps growing and growing. So I have one more as well. Um, do you, you mentioned at the really, you know, very beginning of this podcast, kind of how you spend your time and um, that you do this a little bit on the side. Do you ever see it becoming a full-time job? Is that something you've kind of 
started to look at it at all? So the answer is yes. Uh, okay. I, I, I do work with clients, you know, on the side and as mm -hmm. much free time I have outside of making videos and academic work. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's a scary thing because uh, one of the last things that Seam, Seamland and I talked about was, you know, he's completely doing it on his own. And uh, my channel, I don't think is big enough, at least from YouTube, the YouTube side, in terms of payment to sustain me on my own. And I do, the, the mm -hmm. client work does bring in a decent amount of revenue, but, you know, a, a consistent revenue where I wouldn't have to worry about it. Not just, it's just not yet, you know, but then uh, that could change because, um, you know, I see, I see like Morgan, Morgan uh, Dr. Morgan Levine wrote a book and Addy has got a book and everybody's got a book, Lu uh, you know, F uh, Fontana, Luigi Fontana. Mm -hmm. uh, there's at least a, a one book in this whole approach, you know, just, just documenting <laughs> the is. progress, you know, even just on a uh, blood biomarker, quote unquote, Bible for what's optimal for health and longevity without my own individual data put in there is like a book, right? So, um, they, all right, then the question is, can book sales be enough to sustain me, right? Yeah. Can I get a book deal and the uh, advance will sustain me for a few months long enough to write the book? Is that, I, I don't even know how that process works. I don't, I don't even know yeah. if that's possible. So it's a little bit scary, you know. Uh, it is. It, it's all about just, you know, security. And again, knowing kind of what's, what's going to be there, I think is, is the hard part. And it's, it's hard to create content sometimes, right? Like I'm sure maybe you you have a bigger passion for it than i do but you know i'm um with that english background of yours too sometimes it's i do think it takes it, one of the best skills is taking you know something that's a very 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 complex subject and breaking it down for the lay person and again you do a really good job at that so you know maybe it's not if it becomes a full-time job but when or if you yeah. really want that to happen no, i definitely do i definitely do and in terms of content i see that all over youtube too where people are you know, you can tell when someone's dying for some content. Uh, it, I, I have no shortage of that. Like I, I have, I have so many tabs that are open that like stuff yeah. that I'm oh going to, you know, the, it, but I just don't have the time. I have to, you know, uh, it's, you know, I, I have, I, it's limited time. Right. But then the other yeah. side of that is if I'm out of academia, some of those papers, papers that I have access to, how am I going to have access, you know? So uh, there's that side of it too. But there, you know, I'm even thinking about, ex so the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand doesn't just apply to health optimization. There are whole other sides, which maybe it gets into weird fringe, but um, I, I have visions of expanding beyond just the health stuff, which could help because there's a broader interest. You know, there'll be people in the channel that are here for health. There are people here that are here for other stuff. And I don't know if I want to say it yet. I, I don't know, you'll, you, you know, maybe I'll get judged, but I don't care. It's the other stuff I'm passionate about. And really, cool, oh, yeah. really cool stuff. Well, I think as people follow you along, um, I mean, you'll see this with a lot of like celebrities, famous actors, singers, whatnot. As people follow along, you'll realize that it's, yes, sure, maybe initially they got interested because of the subject, but they're going to stay because they like you, right? And they want to know your opinion. So um, I think that's huge. I mean, uh, you know, you can say it with like Taylor Swift, for example, right? You have these Swifties and they're just like, they probably don't like all of her music, but they love her. And that's why she's like had $5 billion to the country with her tour and whatnot. So, um, you know, that's kind of a, a wild example there, but yeah, I'm excited to follow along and see what you come up with yeah. because you know, I'm, I'm here for, for you and, and what you're doing, but obviously became interested because of the scientific perspective that you're taking and approach. It kind of goes to the idea of diversification. Like imagine if true diagnostic only focused on Horvath, Hannum and Donita oh, Pace. Yeah. Like you guys have, you know, like we've talked about, like you've told told me, and I won't say anything about what may be coming, but you yeah. haven't released yet. But like you guys are on that cutting edge. And I know that that's cutting edge because some of the same stuff we were talking about, I'm studying in my own stuff academically, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's just yeah. broaden, yeah. broadening the horizon. So now it attracts the wider audience. Like if you only focused on epigenetics, there may be a very small window of people who are interested in, in that. Yeah. Now you branch it out into these other metrics too. And now you're engaging a wider audience. So it's kind of, it's kind of like that too. Like, uh, for example, I'll give you an example. Exactly. I'll give you an example. So, uh, and this, there are going to be people who are like, man, you've lost it. You know, you're too old. You're talking about crazy stuff. When I, no, I want to hear it. Yeah, <laughs> when I see houses, like, uh, you know, I'm thinking about buying a house. Boston's crazy expensive. It's ridiculous. But anyway, you look at these houses and they last maybe a hundred years, like a really good, well-constructed house. If you're lucky a hundred years, some of the houses, that I've seen, they're like sheds 
you know, the, the, a hard wind comes and it looks like it'll blow the house down, right? So, you know, if you go back far, and I, I can't say when these things were constructed, but if you looked at like temples, and I, I'm not even talking about Egypt, but like uh, in India and all of these, these, you know, uh, the kind of crazy stuff that Graham Hancock is on about, you know, these megalithic structures that are carved mm -hmm. out of the rock, out of the mountain. This to me is a longevity mindset. Like whoever did that yeah. stuff, whether it was people a thousand years ago or way older than that, that mindset was we're going to construct something that, that exists for a very long time. That's the conquer yeah. aging or die trying mindset. So uh, yeah. I have ideas to maybe start interviewing people who are, who are uh, looking into those kinds of things. You know, um, I, I probably I like it than later. Yeah. And that, I'd be interested. I'm just saying yeah. <laughs> my opinion matters at all. Um, it does. but no, that's, that's great. So everyone who's listening, you know, check out Dr. Michael Lesgarten. He has his YouTube channel um, and a lot of other ways that you can connect it with him as well. You know, all these social media platforms on conquer aging or, or die trying. Um, the one question I ask everyone at the end, Michael, is if you could be any animal in the world, what would you be and why? Man. Uh, <laughs> so my favorite, I have two favorite animals, uh, monkey oh. and elephant. And, well, three octopus. Um, okay. But okay. man, I don't know if I could be an animal. I mean, how about how about? Uh, so technically, we're all animals, right? I mean, all of us. Yeah. Yes. It should be if you could be another animal. So I mean, it's all perspective, right? So if you take, so you know, Michael Rose, you've, you've got the uh, fruit fly stock, and you selectively allow the longer lived ones to breed with each other, and the shorter lived ones breed with each other, and before you know it, two thousand generations later, you've got the long lived flies and the short lived flies, but they started from the same <laughs> founder stock. So if I could be any animal, I'd be the, you know, 2000 generations from now version of whatever humanity is relative to this version of me now. Wow. I love it. No one's answered that. That's a great way to put it and bring it back to your platform. No, that's, that's awesome. I love that, that answer. Um, and then about you, you know, where can people find you if you just want to reiterate that again? Yeah, all over the interwebs, uh, conquer aging or die trying, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, yep. YouTube, Patreon, uh, LinkedIn. Yes. Yeah, everywhere. I'm, I'm everywhere. Everywhere. I even respond. Awesome. I'm, I'm responding to comments everywhere too, because, you know, unlike, uh, I don't want to put other people on blast, but I'm a man of the people. I'm here to serve on a, you know, Every every video I make, I'm responding to comments. Even Seamland's video that we did on his channel. Yeah. I went to his channel yeah. and he didn't respond to any of them yet. I was responding to people asking questions. So uh Yeah. I'm everywhere. I'm no, that's great. Reddit. And and I feel like I get told this and I do this, but you know, I respond to emails fairly quickly. I think you respond to emails very quickly yeah. as well. And I'm like, yes, um, sure. you know, and you know, I know you're, you're busy, but you really do prioritize the relationships yeah. and your, your interactions with people as well. So I, I definitely appreciate Just that. Just real quick. There, there are scientists who are terrible at emails and I'm sure, you know, I, I, ne I'll never be like that. Even with like papers, you know, you get like a paper and you have two weeks yeah. to review it. I try to review it as fast as possible because I don't want to be the person that keeps it holding it up for two weeks. So somebody's got to set the good example. So that's, I mean, I, I say it humbly. I'm just, you know, trying to lead a good example. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Michael. We've come to the end of this amazing podcast. Remember for those listening who want to connect, you can reach out, Google his name. And again, thank you for joining us here at Everything Epigenetics. Remember you have control over your epigenetics. So tune in next time to learn more. Thanks everyone. Thanks.